will introduce us to the Shalima, who is the moderator, and uh, she would hand over to uh, uh, Professor Shepard, who would handle the Q&A. Right, Robin, we are live on YouTube, but we <clears throat> want to get you recording. Okay, so we're going to start in just a few minutes. Okay, so we uh, start formally now and we are recording and live stream on YouTube. So a lot of people are looking at us. We can't see them, but they can see us and hear us. So we begin uh, formally now. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Namaste. Assalamu alaikum. This is the 103rd edition of our Zoom public meeting. For 102 unbroken continuous weeks, we have been here every single Sunday. In the past two years and three weeks, we have featured over 324 presenters from all parts of the world speaking on 102 topics. We wish to sincerely thank all those who have contributed in whatever way to the success of this ongoing Pan-Indo-Caribbean and Pan-Indian diaspora project. Our chairperson today slash tonight is Kerian Abdul Ramjatan, who is a secondary school teacher with the Ministry of Education in Trinidad and Tobago. She is pursuing her PhD in literature on the Trinidadian novelist Ismit Khan. Carrie Ann, welcome. Please chair the meeting. Thank you so very much, Dr. Mahabir, uh, for that warm welcome. You know, it's always my absolute pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, good night, good morning, good evening. Namaste, assalamu alaikum to all of you, depending on the time zone in which you live, of course, because there are always people with us who are coming from all over the world. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a weekly forum, which is hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center, which is a legally registered research and publishing company operating since 2010. And the like today, we often partner with the Ambina Gafur Institute for the study of indentureship and its legacies, led by Professor David Dabadeen. Today, we are also partnering with the Center for Reparation Research at the University of the West Indies in the Mona campus in Jamaica, chaired by Professor Vereen Shepherd. We are so honored to have her give a short keynote address in a few minutes. Today, our program is also being supported by the Sports and Culture Fund of the Office of the Prime Minister of the Government of Trinidad and Tobago. Our moderator this evening or tonight is Ms. Shalima Mohammed, the co-director of this Zoom platform. She is also a business teacher and researcher from Trinidad and Tobago. She obtained her master's degree in business psychology uh, from Franklin University in the USA. So we welcome Ms. Shalima Mohammed. Shalima, welcome and please take over from here. Great, thank you so much, Carrie Ann. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Namaste and a very, very warm welcome to all of you. We're especially pleased that you could join us at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, this public meeting will take the form of a panel discussion. So I'll ask you to kindly mute your mic unless you have to speak. The microphone icon or symbol is at the lower left corner of your screen. And as we know, the background noise can be distracting. So let us please try to avoid that. Today's meeting will be longer than previous ones, but should not exceed three hours. And this is because of the topic for discussion, which is, should Indians in the diaspora demand reparation for indentureship? The Indian indenture system was a scheme of bonded servitude in which more than 1 million Indians were transported as laborers to European colonies 
as a substitute for slave labor following the abolition of slavery in the early 19th century. The system was used in the British Empire from 1833, in the French colonies from 1848, and in the Dutch Empire from 1863. British Indian indentureship lasted until the 1920s. It resulted in the development of a large Indian diaspora in the Caribbean, East and South Africa, Reunion, Seychelles, Mauritius, and Fiji. Some of those recruited to work in the former colonies were kidnapped, deceived, and compelled to work on the plantations where they suffered all kinds of human rights violations, abuse, and exploitation. It is in this context that the question of reparations has arisen. Ladies and gentlemen, we will hear from a total of 11 speakers today. These are esteemed persons whose contributions are highly valued. To the speakers, with the exception of Professor Vereen Shepherd, I appeal to you to restrict yourselves to five minutes for your presentation. Please understand that we have to manage the speaking time wisely so that there will be ample time for discussion during the Q&A session, which will follow all 11 presentations. I will really appreciate your cooperation. And why is Professor Vereen Shepherd the exception? Professor Shepherd is the director of the Center for Reparation Research at UE in Jamaica. She is also the vice chair of the CARICOM Reparation Commission. Professor Shepherd is also the newly elected chair of the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Congratulations to you, Dr. Shepherd, on that recent appointment. You can go ahead and make your presentation now. Thank you very much. And to be honest, I'm going to, because I'm so keen to hear the perspectives from around the Indian diaspora, I, I'm going to keep my, my introductory remarks um, short as well. So, you know, just to be in line. So let me say greetings, everyone, because I know you're joined in from different time zones. And I want, also want to say happy Indian Arrival Day to all the communities that have either celebrated already um, who are celebrating today like Jamaica and who will celebrate later uh, this month. I want to welcome everybody to this e-conversation on the question that you've already heard, but I'll repeat, should Indians in the diaspora demand reparation for indentorship? I also bring greetings from the CARICOM Reparations Commission and chaired by Professor Sir Hilary Beckles and the Center for Reparation Research. Both the CRC and the CRR initiated the idea of having this virtual conversation. I should especially like to thank Dr. Kumar Mahabir, Professor David Dabadeen, the Amina Gafur Institute and the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center for partnering with us so that we can have this open and honest conversation about reparation, diversity and inclusion. Recently, there has emerged a noticeable increase in conversations and even, even to be honest, some accusations leveled at the CARICOM Reparations Commission and the various national committees that not only is there a top-down approach in a movement which has started, was, which was started by indigenous peoples and enslaved Africans who objected to the obscenity of colonialism and carried on by freed people and Rastafari in the racist post-slavery era, but that there is a lack of diversity on the commission, in the national committees, and in the victims whose historical experiences are at the forefront of the campaign for repatriate justice. More specifically, indigenous peoples, Rastafari, and, and, and those descended from indentured uh, Asians, in particular indentured Indians in the region, have complained that they are either not or insufficiently represented on the CRC and in national committees. Further, Indians descended from indentured workers argue that their experiences are not represented in the 10 point plan of CARICOM and in the articulated demands for repatriate justice, particularly from Britain and France. Indians claim that there is insufficient attention to the descendants of 19th century deceptive indentureship in the justificatory narrative for reparation. And this is more strident in countries with large populations of the descendants of indentured Indians. To be honest, I don't hear too much about this 
in the Jamaican space, um, but um, maybe actually I will correct me about this. I also do not hear the voices of the Chinese in this discussion, even though the CRC consistently includes deceptive indentureship in its advocacy. In Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, and Suriname in particular, scholars, and not just Asian scholars, have been critiquing the school's history texts and the examination boards and insisting on more obvious inclusion of their causes. Some Indians claim that reparation should not then be confined to the descendants of those who suffered in what we call the African Holocaust. In other words, the entire region remains underdeveloped with huge inequities and inequalities in the social infrastructure, the result of centuries of the extraction of its resources by some European states and or their citizens. They have been affected by the region's poverty and underdevelopment. They claim therefore that a development plan will benefit those who are descendants of exploiters. So I hope that we will find common ground today to go forward so that we can have a, a discussion about inclusion. And I think everybody already knows that the major importers on this side of the, 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 the globe in the Caribbean were Guyana, Trinidad and Tobago, Suriname, Guadeloupe, Jamaica, Martinique, St. Lucia, French Guyana, Grenada, St. Vincent, St. Kitts, Nevis, um, who had much smaller numbers. And um, many Indians argue that they have a right to be included in the movement on the following more specific grounds. But I'll just mention one. They have been affected by post-slavery ideologies that rank skin color with dark skin people. They have been subjected to discrimination within and outside of their community. For example, the caste system, even though some people say it did not follow Indians to the Caribbean, we know differently. So skin color hierarchy have affected, especially those who still live in rural communities or who lived in rural communities for a long time. And they were subjected to French and British colonial harm. And so I'm anxious to hear this kind of global discussion so that we can talk about it among ourselves and come to a resolution at the end of our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Shepard. That was a very useful and informative introduction. So at the end of all these uh, presentations, I will let you know when the Q&A will begin. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to Professor David Davidine. He is the director of the Amina Gafur Institute. He's a former professor of the University of Warwick and former director of the East Facade Center for Caribbean Studies. Welcome, Professor Davidine. Always nice to have you. Go ahead, please. Thanks, thanks a lot. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Corrine, for that overview and for initiating this, um, this event, which promises to be historic since I think it's the beginning of, of, a, of a longer dialogue. I'd like to um, also acknowledge the presence of two of our honorary patrons of the Amina Gafur Institute, uh, Pat Rodney and Cal Toraboli. Now, uh, historians and academics worldwide <clears throat> have um, characterized uh, empire and colonialism as being immersed in cruelty, violence, exploitation, uh, racism. As um, Shashi Tharoor says, uh, he uses the word loot, which is a Hindi word, I believe, which is now passed into the English language appropriately. We were looted, we were plundered. And I would argue that, um, that Europeans plundered and looted India when they shipped Indians to their colonies as slaves, as well as indentured laborers. <clears throat> Professor Andrea Major in her book, Slavery, Abolitionism and Empire in India, 1772 to 1843, argues that Britons and Europeans were involved in and exporting Indian slaves, transferring them around the subcontinent or to, or to European slave colonies across the globe. So the enslavement of Indians preceded indentureship, and in fact, the enslavement of Indians only ended in 1843 with the Indian Slavery Act forced upon the East India Company. Uh, that was in 1843, which is 10 years after the Slavery Abolition Act in the Caribbean, which eventually freed enslaved Africans. So, 
in the, involving Indo-Caribbean people in the reparations movement could produce, I would argue, or surmise the following. It will be an acknowledgement that Indians were subjected to the, to the cruelty, violence, exploitation, and racism, which are the characteristics of empire and colonialism. Their experiences were significantly different from, from enslaved Africans, but also significantly alike in many ways. So we can compare and contrast. Uh, involving in the Caribbean people in the reparation movement <clears throat> also promises to give all of us a common project, common goal. At the moment, reparations are seen as an African Caribbean project and Indians are not invited to the table when many, including me, would like to be invited to the table. So involvement in the reparation movement <coughs> in, uh, in, in, in terms of Indians could help to reduce the tribalism and the racial and ethnic divisions in our region, since we have a common front, a common purpose. Thirdly, it would, it would acknowledge the growing population of, of people of dual ancestry, children of Indian and African Union. Uh, called Douglas in Guyana. I don't think it's a derogatory term as yet. It's a Hindi term meaning bilingual. Um, so how do we, it, it, we have to acknowledge the growing population of people in the growing uh, amount of people in, in Guyana and elsewhere of dual heritage. So they're, they're African as well as the, the Indian, the African as well as the Indian aspects and heritage of their, of their selves have to be acknowledged. Lastly, and I'll end on this, India. If we can, via our High Commissioners, persuade India to ally with the African Union in the reparation movement, then we have a very powerful advocacy presenting a united front to Britain and to Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor David Davidy. That was an excellent overview. We will now move on to our third speaker. And it is my pleasure to introduce the chief director of this weekly Zoom program. He's an anthropologist, university lecturer, and author of an oral history of indentureship, a landmark book entitled, The Still Cry. Welcome Dr. Kumar Mahavir. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shalima. Um, uh, please feel free to stop me anytime you wish. I would start by giving uh, just a few sentences, uh, an overview of, about indentorship in Trinidad. The first ship of indented immigrants arrived in Trinidad on May 30th, 1845. So next week, Monday, will mark the 177th anniversary of that historic journey. From 1845 to 1917, a total of, 100, of nearly 144,000 bonded laborers came from India to these shores, the second highest total in the Caribbean after Guyana. Now, um, immigration ended in 1917, but indentorship itself ended in 1920, which makes 85 years of that indentorship experience in Trinidad and Tobago. Now, not always was the decision to migrate voluntary. Some immigrants were deceived, others were cajoled, some compelled uh, in the recruitment depots in Calcutta. So I now read to you just a little extract from my book, The Still Cry, which you have referenced. And this is uh, verbatim. I had the pleasure, the honor, the privilege of interviewing and meeting uh, these surviving ex-indented immigrants and I recorded them and I'm going to read uh, uh, what they said about that experience, particularly in the depot. So this is Sankar talking about his experience in the depot in Calcutta. But the officer, the ego, hot oil and true on you. Yeah, hot oil and true on you. They will make you Afraid. They go hunt you. They go hit you until you tell them, I go in. I go in. I go go. So they compel you, put you in the power garden. They go hunt you. They go hit you. 
Now, if you're smart, you go give them your name to let them put it in the book. Uh, all right. And when the white man come Sunday, Sunday, he go ask you again three times. When he see the name in the book, no my dad. All right. He go ask you, the white man, he go ask you, you go in with your good mind or you go in by compelling power. And I say, Sahib, I go in with my own mind. I go in with my own mind. So that was an excerpt from the reading. And uh, I am saying my argument is that um, we should demand a reparation um, for indentorship because of the cruelties and the atrocities that we suffered. Um, there were unavoidable deaths in the voyage. We have the figures, a lot of actually books have been written on these voyages and the number of deaths, um, sometimes as high as 35% of infants under the age of one died on these voyages. So um, I would go, we don't have the time to go into the conditions which cause these deaths. I would like uh, um, reparation, not to individuals, not to individuals, to the community in the form of programs, in the form of institutions, in the form uh, of, of, of centers to treat alcohol abuse, which is widespread in the Indian community in Trinidad and the entire diaspora. The suicide rates are high in Trinidad, not to mention Guyana, top in the world ratings. Suriname is not far behind. Um, and uh, because of all these intergenerational trauma, which we still suffer. And diabetes as well, very high in Trinidad, higher than in Guyana, um, everywhere, because remember, uh, during indentorship, some of the wages were paid in rum. Heart diseases, so we want reparation, intervention to treat these ailments of heart disease. And we want reparation for the Husse Muharram massacre of Indians in Trinidad that took place on the 30th of May, 1884. 22 Indians were killed and over 100 injured in a hail of bullets fired by the British security forces, British security forces at a peaceful religious procession. The tragedy has been described by historian Dr. He Dr. Kelvin Singh as the bloodiest event of British rule in colonial history. We demand, and closing, we demand reparations for land, property, and money that indented Indians lost because the state, the colonial government, did not recognize children and their spouses of those who were married under Hindu and Muslim rights. In conclusion, I would like to destroy the misconception that most Indians got free land for indentorship. First, they were granted land that was not free, not given freely to them. It was payment in exchange for their promised return passage back to India. The fact that should be emphasized is that Indians in Trinidad got only 4% of land in that agreement, 4%. In Guyana, it was only 2%. Because we hear a lot of talk about Indians get land and why do they want reparation and so on. And the land they got was swamp land, lagoon land. The majority of Indians then, as today, purchased the land through heart, to sweat and tears and sacrifice. Thank you very much. Thank you for not going over time as well. And uh, we appreciate hearing the voice of the indentures and um, contextualizing the position uh, that you've taken. Thank you very much, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to Guyana and we will now hear from Mr. Ashok Ramsra. He is the president of the Indian Diaspora Council and an activist in New York, as well as the global Indian diaspora community of people of Indian origin. Mr. Amsaran, welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you so very much. I will summarize the main points, highlighting the three areas suggested by the organizers and uh, focusing on justification for reparation. First, an overview. So much has been written by so many over the years, historians, researchers, and scholars. Beginning in 1838 and officially ending in 1917, the number of arrivals in Guyana, 239,000, 
returnees 75,000, a net of 165,000. Terms, five years, with five years renewable option. Classification, indentured laborers, also known as gametias. Starting in 1828 in Reunion Island and continuing to 1917, spanning countries in several continents, including earlier in Malaysia and contract labor in East Africa. The Indian National Council and the Kenyan Guyanese Congress agreed that this term captures it the best, Indian indentureship bondage. These included brutality imposed by the plantation owners with intolerable inhumane work conditions and horrible living conditions, besides the deaths on the voyages and in the plantations. The objective was to maximize profits for the owners in the UK, and we all know the motivation. Certainly the same in other colonies, English, Dutch, French, and Portuguese as profits were the motiva prime motivation. These levels of atrocities were so severe in some plantations that laborers resorted to work stoppage, resistance, and riots. But these were quickly quelled, sometimes with extreme measures, including killings. The justification. Yes, the Indian Diaspora Council International is in favor of reparation for indentureship. The extent, value, and content of reparations should be determined through in-depth negotiations between the sense of Indian indentureship and British slash French slash Dutch slash Portuguese governments and descendants of indentureship. Notwithstanding the enormous progress of succeeding generations of Indian indentured. Brutal colonial treatment of Indian indentureship labors or de deprivation of rights. Replete with arbitrary penalties, punishment and torture at the sole discretion of the plantation owners. That is not to in any way diminish the inhuman, torturous and despicable treatment of slaves brought from Africa to these colonies. Despite the enormous progress by the descendants in succeeding generations, it was indeed a torturous experience and cannot be denied or forgotten. Firstly, breach of contract, a universally accepted reason for compensation in any transaction. Indian indentureship was organized with a legally binding contract for each laborer. Two, payment per contract, it was not negotiated. It was arbitrarily designed by the plantation owners with UK government blessings. Take it or leave it. Professor Lomash Rupnarang wrote extensively about violation of indentureship contract uh, and no penalty imposed on plantation owners freedom of plantation owners to do as they wanted to inflict pain and suppress the Indian laborers solely to increase profits. In addition, only 1% of Indian indentured laborers received land in lieu of return passes to India. It's a violation of the contract and there is no, and there is compensation due to the descendants of those who were denied. In fact, this 1% is less than the 4% Dr. Mahavi just mentioned. GIA in Guyana noted that Indian indentured laborers those were significantly punished with harsh prison terms for labor infraction. In 1884, for example, 13% of indentured laborers were jailed, which comprised 44% of the prison population. Isn't that amazing? In short, Indian laborers were penalized in so many ways to reduce their work pay and increase their contracts with penalty extents arbitrarily imposed on them by plantation owners. The laborers had no choice but to accept what the plantation owners meted out to them. Conditions of brutality and abuse, physical and mental, inhumane working conditions, and poor living conditions. According to Wikipedia, slave owners were paid approximately 20 million pounds in compensation over 40,000 awarded for enslaved people freed in the colonies in the Caribbean, Mauritius, and the Cape of Good Hope, according to government census in 1834, debts to slave owning families, which were eventually repaid until 2015. Friends, this is only seven years ago. The money was being paid from 1834 to 2015. So there is precedence, even very recent payments. Other recent examples of reparations, Harvard University, Cambridge University, Holocaust, reparations to survivors and descendants, USA, slavery and indentureship, 
acknowledgement, apologies, direct payments, funds for studies, scholarship, museum, and similar forms of compensation. Extensive research and writings on this topic have been done by many outstanding historians and researchers. There is no shortage of information on this topic. I'll conclude with a proposal. The Union Diaspora Council proposes a serious class action among global partners impacted by Indian indentured bondage and other atrocities with due consideration to all legal aspects, responsible parties such as colonial powers, plantation owners, booker, and successors, the short and long-term consequences of such atrocities, the merits, the precedence, if any, pragmatic framework for restitution and compensation, including Chinese and Portuguese as well, and a follow-up in a sustained manner to the project's conclusion. My recommendation, collaboration with global entities such as National African American Reparation Commission and the CARICOM Reparation Commission, uh, the African Union and others. The form, extent, and value, content of reparations should be determined through in-depth negotiation and based on thorough analysis and practice. Thank you for your patience. I can answer questions later in the session or you can contact me directly. Thank you, Ashu. Um, uh, we look forward to those questions coming in at the end of the session. We now move on to Suriname. We'll now hear from Dr. Maritz Hassan Khan. He is a researcher and former head of the history department at Anton de Com University. He is also the co-author of the historical database in Suriname. Welcome, Dr. Hassan Khan. You can go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. As I have only five minutes. I will try to be very short. Uh, the question is, should Indians in the diaspora demand reparation for indentureship? My answer is definitely yes. I think that we all agree that indentureship was an exploitative system set up and used by the colonial powers to make profits for their own benefit. It is for me, incomprehensible that the CARICOM as a regional organization consisting of former colonies of European powers has decided to demand only reparations for descendants of the indigenous people and the descendants of the enslaved people. Why the other people of the Caribbean are excluded? Does this mean that, for instance, the descendants of indentured laborers are no citizens of these countries or that their ancestors were not exploited by colonialism? These are very important questions. Do the leaders of CARICOM believe that indentured laborers were not exploited? I was surprised to learn that UWE Research Center for Reparations established in Jamaica uh, until recently also was only uh, uh, propagating reparations for descendants of indigenous people and enslaved. I do hope that they have changed their minds and I'm very glad with the uh, presence of Professor Shepard now and he, she is talking about inclusiveness. And I'm really, really very, very glad with her uh, speech and that that opens the door for discussions and dialogue about this matter. My own perception of indentureship is that notwithstanding exploitation and suppression by colonial authorities and plantation management, the indentured laborers were able to work on a better life than they had in India at the time of their departure. In the case of Suriname, I have described in my article, The Indian Indentured Experience in Suriname, uh, published in 2016, in which I have argued that and shown that colonial authorities have violated provisions of the Immigration Treaty of 1870. You know, there was a treaty between United Kingdom and the Dutch government in order to, to get permission for recruitment of indentured laborers. And in that treaty, there were regulations about, uh, for instance, the, the work and wages. And 
Also, the colonial authorities and the plantation management have also violated the individual contracts because in, in the treaty and in the, in the individual contracts was the regulation that in any way, always the earned minimum uh, wage should be not less than 60 cents for men and 40 cents for women per day. And they have, the, the colonial authorities in Suriname have systematically manipulated statistical figures in the annual immigration reports regarding the number of working days and the wages. According to their figures, the average wages were higher than the fixed minimum. While I have shown in my article that these wages were structurally lower than the average minimum. So they have really manipulated the, 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 the figures. In this respect, it is interesting to mention that in 1903, after the court case regarding the Mariam Burak uprising, of 1902, you know that in Suriname, we had a very, very huge uprising in which 24 people were shot dead. That the government, the governor of Suriname came to the conclusion that something was really wrong about the wages. He appointed a commission to consider a revision of the labor contracts and to advise the governor in this matter. The commission came to the conclusion that the immigration treaty of 1870 and the labor contracts were very clear in this matter and that no changes were needed. The consequence was, however, that the business was continued as usual. That means that the wages were in many cases very low. And the, 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 the question of wages was the main reason of a discontent among the laborers in Suriname during the whole period from 1873 until 1917, 1918. My conclusion is that the descendants of endangered laborers or the Gimitias, as they are called now, have a strong case for advocating reparations from the former colonial powers. Reparations doesn't mean that the descendants will get money individually, as Dr. Kumar Mahbi said, but the former empire should make resources available for projects for the improvement of social and economic situation of the uh, of the the, the, in, the descendants of the endangered laborers in the new home countries and societies, and I want to say also that uh, two years ago I heard about the restorative justice. That is a good idea, and then also that uh, among the descendants of Indian. Uh, indentured laborers, you have intergenerational traumas, just as you have among the descendants of the slaves. I think these are very important things. And if we talk about the reparations, we should talk about projects to, to improve the situation economically, socially, mental health, and so on. And I do hope that the time is now uh, right to take actions to the head of states of the CARICOM. Within a few weeks, we have a meeting of the head of states of CARICOM. And my recommendation, advice to this session, is that we formulate something and, and submit it to the, 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 the uh, meeting of the head of the committees about the inclusion of the descendants of indentured laborers in the question of reparations that they should be included also. That is my, my point. And I hope if there are questions, I don't go to the, the content very much because it's only five minutes. It's just talking about principles. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hassan Khan. And I totally agree with you. The intergenerational trauma needs to be addressed.
So we hope to hear more about that during Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now move on to our sixth speaker, and this is Lenroy Thomas, who's from St. Vincent. He is the co-founder of the SVG Indian Heritage Foundation. He has research records at the National Archives in the UK. He's the author of the book entitled Stories from Our Indian Elders. Welcome, Lenroy. Go ahead, please. Um, greetings to everyone. Um, thank you, Shamelia, and to the organizers for inviting us to be part of this discussion. I chatted with the president of the St. Vincent Indian Heritage um, Foundation, and we discussed the question, should Indians of St. Vincent demand reparation for indentorship? And we agree that we definitely should. It is time for us as descendants of these Indians um, to look at this issue. And we the Indians should be the beneficiaries of this reparation. Because sometimes if um, funds arrive, um, other um, projects might be benefiting rather than ours. So maybe NGOs can be set up um, and Indian organizations can be used to monitor the needs or assess the needs of um, people and provide uh, reparation funds or services to them. Our story is a long one that started in India, continued in St. Vincent for 161 years, and it is continuing now in St. Vincent and in Britain. Our story is like that of a neglected child suffering in silence. It is important that we know the story, the history, and I've written a book, um, Stories of Our Indian Elders, um, which include the perspectives of um, our Indian ancestors or elders. Uh, this book is available on Amazon, and I wish that this book um, would be made available to students of the Caribbean. Before, ancestor, before ancestors came to St. Vincent, in, um, Britain was in charge of, the, of India. Britain wreaked havoc in India from the 1600s. This eventually led to the rebellion of six, uh, 15, sorry, 1857, which was followed by vengeful actions where millions suffered and died. It must be noted that the immigration to St. Vincent started just after um, this rebellion, when millions of people were dying in India. The British mismanagement of India led to severe economic hardship and disruption of society, displacement and famines. In the war, they burned the storehouses of seeds and cities were left in ruins. They exported the, light, the little grain that was produced. And while the people were starving, they refused to import rice. They persecuted us for putting up any resistance. So it is against this background of hardship that we migrated to St. Vincent. We wanted to escape the poverty, starvation, and famines in India. Just under 2,500 of us um, traveled from the north, east of India um, to St. Vincent during the period 1861 to 1880. We survived the overcrowded ships, but some of us died on board because of the conditions and um, diseases. Little did we know that we were jumping off of the frying pot into the fire when we migrated to the Caribbean. We were now in the hands of unscrupulous and exploitative planters and overseers. On the estates, the conditions of work were similar to that of slavery. We were victimized and exploited we had to work hard long hours for low wages. We were given hefty sanctions and penalties for minor offenses. We had limited legal recourse when and were wrongly accused. When sugar price declined, more was expected of us. We protested because we didn't get justice. We marched from Argyle to Kingston on October 7, 1882. Eventually, 
Some of us were um, allowed to return to India, but many of us remained in St. Vincent. After indentorship, the hardship continued in St. Vincent. Um, according to one of her elders in my book, she said, he said, I had Yaz, I had Tobo, I had Jigas. Another said, I live in a little wattle house. Another said, this is my aunt, she said, we used to eat breadfruit morning, noon, and night. We were disadvantaged from generation to generation. We were mainly subsistent farmers. We had limited opportunities. Some of us couldn't get to go to school. We had to find ways of surviving, operating donkey carts, vending, making and selling graters, coconut oil, bag, hats. Some of us went to England and um, referred to as the Winrush Win generation. We were again prejudiced there and um, had our legal rights cut. So why should we demand re reparation? Because of the hardship that we suffered in India, because of the hardship and the terrible conditions that we worked under in um, St. Vincent, because of the hardship after um, indentureship, um, that our children and the next generations are going through. We, dis the descendants of indentures, were disadvantaged and still are. Our current situation with less opportunities and privileges is still making it difficult for us to succeed. Thank you. I had to read because I, I'm trying to get it into the five minutes. Thank you. And you All did right. great. You did All great. Right. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll now move on to Dr. Akshay Mansing, who is from Jamaica. He's the Dean of the Faculty of Sport at UE, a senior lecturer in sports medicine and a consultant orthopedic surgeon. He is also a Justice of the Peace and Director of Cricket West Indies. Welcome, Dr. Mansing. Thank you very much, Shalima. And I may be bowling from the other end, but rest assured we're playing in the same match because I'd like to spend a minute just to compare slavery with indentureship to remind people that slavery was forced labor after capture. And this forced labor, really the, the only relief people had perhaps was death. Uh, those who were born into slavery stayed in slavery and had no chance of progressing. And this persisted for almost 300 years. But the other point is that at the abolition of slavery, the landowners were paid compensation for loss of property amount, amounting to almost 7% of the GDP of UK at that time. So these were commodities, the slaves, who were, who were, you know, lost property for these wealthy uh, landowners, and they were, were given compensation. Indentureship was slightly different. There was contract labor. Laborers were paid, and they were paid in, in cash. They were given rations of food, which in the 1970s looked far more attractive than what was available in the supermarkets of Jamaica. Um, and they were offered or, or promised research, return passage home after the contract period, or land in lieu of, of going home. And we will get to the fact that this may not have been honored, but that was what the contract stated. Much of what happened to the indentured laborers, to be honest, was not different than the horrors of colonialism in India itself and what the Indians in India had to face. So it's not like it was all against this group alone. The similar sort of things happened in the home, in, in the home uh, or in the mother country. And incidentally, false coercion still exists for people who are lured to, uh, to, to, to um, jobs overseas. And, and things don't turn out to be as they think it is. The other item I want to look at is the legal versus moral argument, because I don't believe personally, and I'm not a lawyer, that there's much of a legal basis for reparation in principle. However, there are some moral grounds that have to be considered. For example, many were kidnapped, especially young females, um, and, and they perhaps have some grounds that need to be met. Many, as we said, were promised uh, things that were not honored. And we heard just a while ago about land in lieu of, of return home, which by and large was not honored. And perhaps that could be considered a breach of contract. But we also have to remember that many who, who came out on the wrong side financially, well, because they would save their land, save their money, sorry, or, or lodge their money, or give it sort of almost power of attorney to influential Indians, Indo-Jamaicans, who usurped the land and usurped the money as time went on to leave the illiterate um, freed indentured laborers in the lurch. 
So it wasn't just the colonial masses that did it. Uh, their own also betrayed them. The other point I want to make is that perhaps the church is as culpable as the government. Remember that many were denied education for a long time health unless they converted to the church. And even though this may not have been government mandated, they certainly turned a blind eye to it. In fact, in Jamaica, like much of the Caribbean, marriages outside the church were not recognized until 1958, made retroactive to 1954. And therefore, as you heard before, Hindu and Muslim marriages were not recognized. And when families would, would, would form and, and the parents would die, the children were declared bastards and estates were returned to the state. Now, this was, as I said, as much culpability by the government as it is of the church. Many, I will tell you, many Indo-Jamaicans are happy to be in Jamaica, and they believe that they got opportunities that would not have been possible in India. And I tell you that, you know, I'll quote one to say that she's very happy that here she's able to be a professional, whereas had she been in her village, she'd still be bailing roti and, and living a life of poverty. And so many are appreciative of the fact that they're here. So in conclusion, I don't believe that internship is the same or should be equated to slavery. And therefore reparation in my view is a wrong term. Yes, I think that there's discussion to be had, but perhaps the term reparation, because there was no compensation to the owners, may be the wrong term. Legally, I don't think there's any obligation by the government, but morally, as I've said before, the church and government are equally culpable. I think aggrieved parties will struggle to prove their cases on an individual basis, and therefore class action discussion has to take place. But I do believe that what we need are educational programs about all who came, not just the Indians. For example, in Jamaica last week, um, a, a road called Tower Street was renamed the Ambedkar Avenue by the president of India. He, he, he unveiled it. But the point is that there was awareness of who Ambedkar was, led by the Jamaican personnel, uh, and who you know, in the parish council agreed to change the name of, of the road. I also believe that the reparation center at UWI, if it really represents the West Indies, should take this into account and lead that educational program to let everybody know about more than just the ex-slaves. I'll invoke Shashi Tharoor's name again, because when he spoke about the horrors of colonialism, his solution was that there should be reparation of one pound, but recognition of the horrors that took place. Just this week or last week, India surpassed the UK as the fifth richest country in the world. This was done through education and hard work and not through reparation and the likes. It is not much different in the Caribbean as far as the success of the Indians is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mansing. We appreciate all perspectives on this program and I'm sure we'll have uh, many comments and questions for you after. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we now hear from Kiru Naidu from South Africa. Kiru Naidu is a writer based in Durban with a key, keen interest in workers' histories and women's voices during indentureship. Bangladesh market remains his centerpiece or the centerpiece of his writings. Welcome, Mr. Naidu. You have five minutes. Yes, uh, greetings everybody. and. Um to the panel that uh, I'm joining here, as well as those that are joining us online. Uh, thank you for the invitation to this session, and I think it's uh, an especially fascinating discussion. Well, let me begin by nailing my colors to the mask and speaking in favor of a reparatory justice. Uh, I see that from the content of this discussion, you're very skewed towards the Caribbean, and I want to make a case that there are certain specificities about the experience of indenture in South Africa that um, will impact on the nature and the course of this discussion. Perhaps the first point one ought to make is that the struggle for freedom in South Africa created a completely different flavor in that people of Indian origin found common cause with the indigenous majority in South Africa. I saw earlier that we had uh, Jay, Snyder, Jay Naya on, online, and there's a really good example. His brother served 20 years in prison in the same cells. 
as Nelson Mandela. And that is a powerful expression of how people of Indian origin, indentured people, found common cause within the broader struggles. And we're, if we were to speak of reparations in South Africa, I would make the case to say that the nature of oppression in South Africa is multi-layered, multi-textured. And through that very fact, one needs to take an approach that brings everybody into the fold. And if I just dwell on that for a second. In South Africa, the colonial experience was one that took on so many different facets along the entire spectrum of slavery, of land dispossession, of colonialism, unfettered capitalism, of apartheid racism, of indenture. So this experience is something that unites so many streams of the oppressed people. So, you know, in listening to this discussion, I find it very uncomfortable to speak about the specificity of the Indian experience. And I won't just go into the detail of the Indian experience in South Africa because it's very common to all of what you've spoken about over these uh, last hundred odd sessions. Safe to say that there's also a body of literature that says that the conditions on the plantations of Natal were among the most oppressive. And there are particular reasons for that, which won't serve us well to dwell on now. But the hurt and the generational pain that's come with indenture in South Africa is something that warrants atonement. It, it warrants some kind of reparation. And in making this case, I think that we ought to argue, and I liked the point that Professor Davidin made earlier, of pulling together diverse strands and, and stakeholders and interests. I mean, the, the, the argument he made about India, for instance, aligning its case with the African Union. I think that kind of common front that goes to the British government to make this case would be a very com uh, compelling one. But beyond just a claim for reparations from the British government, I think that there is an important case to be made to, for reparations from the plantocracy. The people who owned the plantations, these colonial barons, and something that really grates me uh, today in South Africa is that it's the descendants of, those, of that plantocracy that continues to hold land in South Africa. And the fact that the South African government had to pay several million dollars to get uh, some hectares of land to provide housing for poor people. So that kind of reparations that one would ask for would not go to any particular individuals, but to a collective of groups across the spectrum, across the race spectrum, so that this could have reparations here could have some kind of developmental impact rather than benefiting any one group or any one person. And that ought to break, for instance, you know, Thomas Piketty's line of argument about generational wealth. And I think the descendants of either slavery or dispossessed Africans or the descendants of indentured workers would benefit in that way of this kind of developmental reparation. Let me stop there uh, within this time and I'll contribute in the later discussion. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mr. Naidu. At this time, I would like to uh, say a special welcome to Mrs. Amina Gafur, the patron of the Amina Gafur Institute, who is the co-sponsor of today's program. Welcome, ma'am. I want to uh, bring on now Professor Carl Toroboli. He is from Mauritius. He's a distinguished writer, poet, semiologist, and author of 25 books in French, English, and Creole. He devised a theoretical framework to include slavery and indenture. Welcome, Mr. Toroboli. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Yes, thank you very much for hosting this very interesting session. Um, I think that the word inclusiveness is very important in what we are addressing today. And this has been uh, reminded by some speakers here. Because I would not see 
these two pages of servitude opposing each other in the approach to what we have termed reparations. This framework exists, a methodology exists. And um, I would give a historic example in Mauritius with the Truth and Justice Commission that was established in 2009. I was approached to state my, my thoughts about setting up this commission. And I argued that slavery and indenture should not be separated in the collection of complaints, dolences, to be forwarded to the government. And uh, this is interesting to know my plea was heard. And this gave birth to a very big amount of work and documentation, which covered, I think this is the longest span of, uh, of period covered in servitude in a truth and justice commission in, uh, in the world. It's more than 200 years, not excluding slavery or making a separate claim for slavery and indentured, but also including convict work, la corvée, which is a French word, uh, you, you know, that was used in the past when the landowner uh, could lend his workers to uh, the government, for example, to make roads. So all these types of servitude were pulled in this very interesting document. And of course, the idea of financial compensation cropped up. And um, even if this is still in, in the, on the mind of many people, uh, there was a, maybe a bigger consensus on reparative justice, um, memorial, memorializing indentured slavery, uh, Improving health. I have heard very interesting remarks about diabetes here, for example. There is a phenomenology of the coolie body and the slave body. Diabetes is something we still carry on. Um, somebody said that Fiji has the highest number of diabetic people in the world. I would say Mauritius is even higher than this. And this is a direct consequence of indenture. What I would like to, to, to suggest is, and I'm addressing myself to Dr. Shepard, is we work on the philosophical framework of inclusive indenture and slavery. The name is here, Kulichud. We have been doing this work for 30 years. The philosophy exists, the methodology exists. And I think that by articulating these two main pages of servitude, we can come with a common front with the African governments, Indian government, because we need reparation. I will give two examples in history. You know, the first reparation for slavery was made in, at the end of the 12th century by the French abbot, Stephen um, of, uh, um, ah, he was a bishop, uh, in any case, in, in Stephen of, uh, I've written it badly on my page. In any case, um, uh, yes, of Anjou, Stephen of Anjou, uh, Etienne d'Anjou in French. Uh, he asked reparation from King Canute VI from Denmark because some French people were captured and taken into captivity. He said, even you, if you, the descendants, are not accountable for this, uh, taking our people and enslaving them. Uh, you are enjoying the benefits of this. And he said, we are not forcing this on you. We want, it, uh, we want empathy from you. This is the very first case of a juridical, let's say, um, uh, request made uh, by a, a European concerning European slave. This is a juridical precedence. 
Two other examples of reparations. When uh, slavery was abolished, let's say 1833, 1834 in the British Empire, compensation was given not to the slaves, but to the slave owners. And as you may know, we have in Mauritius, the Mauritius Commercial Bank, which pulled this money into a very successful bank, which is one of the most successful banks in Africa, the Mauritius Commercial Bank. And reparation, financial compensation when was not given to, to the slaves. I give another example in the French Empire in 1848, when slavery was abolished, compensation was given, reparation was given to the slave owners and not to the uh, liberated or emancipated slaves. So there is a case which is interesting here. There is a juridical precedent that in the case of slavery, we can ask reparation because the and imperial powers themselves, they gave back to the wrong people money as reparation. And I would say as a kind of continuity, even if there are differences between indenture and slavery, there were two systems of oppression in, uh, in, in the empire, in the colonial world. This is systemic explo exploitation of labor. Okay, the indentured had a contract, but as you would know, many historians would agree with me that these contracts were abused. So there is a case here to uh, document a reparation case for indentured, which I, I will support very firmly. Excellent. Thank you, Professor Torbuli. You wrapped up just in time. Thank you. I just uh, put a note on the chat, inviting everyone who would have a question or a comment, please use the reaction button at the end of, sorry, at the end of the presentation of our next speaker. We'll now invite Mr. Arlen Harris, who is from India. He's an award-winning filmmaker with over 30 years experience working mainly for British broadcasters such as Channel 4, Channel 5, ITV and BBC TV and radio. Welcome Mr. Harris. Really glad to be here. Um, and um, slight correction, although I'm of Indian descent through my mother, um, I was born in the UK but I'm happy to give an Indian perspective as I've lived and worked in India. Um, for me, one of the most important facets of um, indenture is the fact that most of the indentured came from North India, from Bihar and UP. The reason why I think that's important is because Bihar and Uttar Pradesh were then and remain now um, amongst the poorest parts of India. I mean, in UP, the um, GDP, per the um, earnings per head are comparable to those of people in Mali. In um, Bihar, it's Mozambique. Mortality rates are really, really low. So indenture not only had an effect on those who went and the societies that received them. But also I would argue actually had an impact on India and in the places where people came from. So um, over a million people came from uh, the 19th, the early 20th century, um, over 80 years from Bihar to um, the Caribbean and to other countries, other regions. Um, indenture is remembered in um, literature in India and as part of Gandhi's story. And today in Amitabh Ghosh's Ibis trilogy, there is a ministry of overseas Indian affairs, which has organized conferences and events around indenture. However, it's fair to say that indenture reparations 
as far as I am aware, is not a key priority for the Indian government. So why indenture? Simply um, put, it was a brutal system. Many died on the long voyages from India. And not only was it a, a brutal system, but it was a brutal system that was part of the way that the imperial system of extraction worked globally. Um, people were ill-treated on arrival as indentured workers. All were exploited uh, as replacements for slave labor on plantations. Some were killed fighting for their rights all over what was then the British Empire. Others were killed in communal riots as a result of racial divisions sown by British colonizers for their own profits and convenience. Um, so I think there's ample justification for a demand for rep reparation, but I really feel that it must be seen in the context of, of empire and very much as part of, of a process of restorative justice through reparation. Reparation clearly is not unprecedented. Historically, um, uh, Japan paid compensation um, to the Koreans for ill treatment. Um, Britain has given compensations to the Maoris. Um, Bihar and UP are still incredibly poor, um, as I've said, and yet, those institutions, those um, commercial um, entities that benefited from indenture, um, the banks that loaned for plantations, the insurers that insured the ships on which people traveled, many of those companies are still immensely profitable and are still in existence. And yet Biharis and UPIs, that's the people from Uttar Pradesh, are still forced to migrate. So I'd argue that reparation could help um, prevent another generation of people from that region, the poorest in India, from being forced to move. Um, and not only that, it would be, in my view, a real example of reparative justice if that was a way of compensating some of the people that are left behind, as those, well as those that have returned. Um, because you've had such eloquent speakers and they've made such eloquent contributions, I think I'd probably come in slightly under my five minutes. So um, that's what I have to say. <laughs> you appreciate it, Mr. Harris. Thank you very much for your contribution. Not at all. And at this point, I would like to say thank you very much to all of our speakers. Um, as you know, this program is recorded and will be shared with everyone uh, later. For those of you who just joined us, we've just come to the end of our speakers' presentations. We did indeed have uh, Dr. Farzana Gounder listed as a speaker. Unfortunately, she is unavoidably absent. So at this time, I would like to invite Professor Rureen Shepherd to moderate the Q&A segment. And for those of you again who came in a little late, Professor Rureen Shepherd is the director of the Center for Reparation and Research at UV Jamaica. She's also the vice chair of the Karakam Reparation Commission and the newly elected chair of the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Please use the reaction button to indicate that you would like to ask a question. You just click on the raised hand icon in order to be called upon. Professor Shepard, it's over to you now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. Um, Shalima Mohammed, and uh, thank you for all those who have uh, presented. I just wanted to um, mention that among the historic reparation, we must mention Haiti um, because France extracted reparation from, from Haiti, uh, which was a case of the, the victorious 
being held ransom by the losers. So we must always remember what has happened to Haiti because of that historic reparation. I see three hands so far, Dr. David Subran, followed by Dennis's iPhone. I think whoever is at Dennis's iPhone, you will have the second um, opportunity. And then Sibani Roy, and then I'll take a few more. So um, let's hear from Dr. David Subran. May I ask you to not comment, but to ask quick questions so we can have as many people as possible in on this conversation. Dr. Subran? You're muted, um, Dr. Subran, you're muted. Yes. All okay, right. there you are. Yes, yeah. your question. And, and after that, lower your hand, please. Well, please. In addition to the hardships mentioned by the different speakers, we must remember that the names of the Indians were taken from them in St. Vincent. Their salaries were cut in half in St. Vincent. And, and so on. They had to trade education for change in religion in Trinidad. But um, I believe that there were some compensations. The, the scourge of, of caste discrimination was reduced from the moment you boarded the ship because you all had to eat together. And not all Indians were fooled, many volunteered, such as my grandparents who came here in 1896. They wanted to escape a situation of famine and hunger and being locked for generations in a certain type of low-class life. We are supposed to be a proud and grateful people. How can we seek reparations for events that led to improvements in our life chances? We cannot be skewed or selective in our analysis of historical events and shut our eyes to the great advantages that indentorship brought to the lucky few who were selected as indentured Indians. A quest for reparation comprom can compromise the independence of Indian people in the Caribbean and make them live in a dream for freeness. Thank you. Well, I didn't hear a question, so I'll move on to um, Dennis's iPhone. Yeah, hi, good afternoon, everyone. And I uh, just want to uh, thank all the speakers. I think their remarks were very powerful. Um, I just wanted to throw in a few things here. Um, a few on this panel knows that, you know, I'm one, one person who has gone back from the Caribbean and doing a, uh, a very large um, development project in Bihar, Uttar Pradesh. And one of the things we, we find is accessing British funding to help this project has so many red tapes. It's unbelievable. So I have been pushing for something called a creative economic reparation, where we on the NGO sector will make the case to the British to drive resources, intellectual, financial, and, and other empowering resources to move projects like this forward. And also, the lessons learned from this project is also transferable back into the uh, into the former colonies. Now, the thing that bothers me is I hear the word CARICOM Commission on Reparation. CARICOM is an intergovernmental body, all right, made up by political appointments, driven by political machinery and political parties. How, how is this, and this is what's getting me here, how does this become a political drive? How does it become a governmental drive when, you know, um, this should be more a civil sector type of lobby? If reparation does monetize, I see danger down the road 
with it falling in the hands of the wrong governments or political interests. So I'm very, very opposed to this whole concept of CARICOM driving this on behalf of slavery and indentureship. If you can comment, since you are, the, I believe, the head, the head of the uh, CARICOM Commission. Uh, thank you. No, I'm not the head. Um, Dr. Brown from the Secretariat is on is on this, and I'm going to ask her to answer your question, Dennis. Um, Dr. Hillary Brown. Dr. Brown, well, we'll wait until we, I'll, I'll have your question in reserve until Dr. Brown identifies herself. So I have um, uh, Sibani, Sibani Roy, I think it is. Go ahead. No? All right, Mr. Singh, you have a question? Hello. <clears throat> yes. I hope you can hear me. I am Anirud Singh. Yes. Uh, my great grandfather landed in South Africa in 1863. I am an advocate or barrister of the High Court, and I have submitted a few questions um, on the computer, so I won't go into that. But I think we have to step back for a minute and um, get a bit unemotional. We are talking about international law here. And the first question that arises is which court will have jurisdiction in this matter? So I have submitted a few questions and I'm hoping there will be a follow-up where we can look at the international law uh, that may be applicable or may not be. And how do you bring a class action with claimants from several different countries? It becomes a bit of a nightmare, but I'm prepared to assist if the project is going ahead. Thank you. I think referred to my questions that I have submitted online. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask our moderator to ensure that the chat is saved so that we can see all the questions and um, those who have asked the questions so that we can have follow-up answers if we're not able to get the questions uh, this evening. Um, I'm still asking Dr. Hilary Brown from the CARICOM Secretariat if she could answer the question about the role of CARICOM and why governments are, um, have set up themselves um, in this way. But until she comes uh, online, I'm Hi, going Professor to- Shepard. Oh, you are here. Okay, great, <laughs> Dr. Brown. Um, let me introduce Dr. Brown. She is in the Secretariat of the CARICOM um, in Guyana. And also she manages the Secretariat for the CARICOM Reparation Commission, which is headed by Professor Sir Hilary Beckers, right. not by Vereen Shepherd. <laughs> Over to you, uh, Dr. Brown. Uh, thank you so much, Prof. Shepherd. Uh, yes, I was just about to highlight that too, that the, the chair of the commission is Professor Sir Hilary Beckles. But let me say um, thank you so much to the Center for Reparation Research and for the collaboration um, on this forum today. Uh, and let me say how um, I've listened very keenly and closely to all of the presenters and thank you so much for um, the depth of, of information that you have brought to the dis discussion. So very quickly to address the issue that was raised about um, civil society versus government. And I think it's, it's important to realize and certainly the CARICOM Reparations Commission recognizes the important um, pioneering and consistent work of Rastafari, of um, Pan-Africanists, of all the civil society groups in the region that have really kept this torch alive of, of reparations. All of our artists who have been singing about the issues um, of oppression, of colonialism, of enslavement, um, of indentureship, so we recognize the very important role of civil society and civil society is a part of all of the national committees um, that make up the CARICOM Reparations Commission. However, at the same time, I think that what is groundbreaking about the commission being established by CARICOM heads of government in 2013 is that if we now want to raise a formal case against governments in Europe. It is the governments of the region 
that really need to advance that case in collaboration with civil society. And we know that Rastafari, they have tried to petition the queen in the past, the queen of England, um, but it is the joining of forces of government and civil society that really takes the advocacy and this work, I think, to um, a different level and which I think is a necessary level. So it's not that we are um, dis discounting or disregarding um, civil society's role has a critical role in public education, in public mobilization, ensuring that youth are on board and so on. Um, but it has to be a partnership with government if we are going to take this to the United Nations, take it to the International Court of Justice and engage all of our governments. And since I have the floor, maybe I could ask one question, which is a question that I know the CARICOM Reparations Commission has discussed recently. And that is looking at the whole issue of what constitutes, well, there are, there are established definitions of what constitutes a crime against humanity. And so that includes enslavement, genocide, dehumanization. I think one of the important points that, I, um, well, obviously this wasn't a forum speaking specifically about slavery, but I think it's important to highlight that all of the slave laws and slave codes said that people of African descent were not humans. They were not full humans. It was in law that um, Africans were three quarters of humans. So there's a dehumanization component as well as enslavement, as well as genocide of Africans and of indigenous people. And that is not to say that, that we don't understand and take on board completely the nature of the gross violation of human rights under indentureship. But as we look at building a legal case, the question that I ask is, can we also classify indentureship as a crime against humanity? And in the dialogue then, where does it fit? And I'm not saying that it doesn't fit, but I'm saying that this is one of the core arguments that we are advancing in the reparations movement. So I would love to hear views on that as well. Thank you very much. Professor. Thank you, thank you. But before you go, there were two questions. There were, there were um, three, two questions in the chat and one comment. Let me deal with the comment. The comment is from my, 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 my brother, Stephen Golding. And I think he's appealing to us to engage in language deconstruction um, and appealing to us not to use the word slaves. Um, because people were enslaved and they were indentured. That was not their natural condition. So that we have to be careful about how we speak about our ancestors. Then um, Dr. Dr. Brown, the question was asked, who are the defendants? So in the case of CARICOM, um, when, we talk, when we talk about a legal case, who are the defendants? And the other question was, what do we mean by reparation? It's not only for you. Um, anybody could jump in of the presenters, but since you are on the floor, I wanted to ask you, what do we mean by when we say reparation in the CARICOM um, Reparation Commission sense and who are the defendants? Okay, so um, the mandate that came from our heads of government in 2013 um, was to pursue reparations for quote, native genocide and enslavement. And so this is why this has been the initial, um, the initial mandate approach of the CARICOM Reparations Commission. Um, and over time, we have been interrogating the mandate. And this is why we are having this forum and because we have heard um, the call for inclusiveness. And um, so essentially, uh, we are seeking reparations, um, essentially summarized in the 10 point plan that, was, that has been articulated by the CARICOM Reparations Commission. And it starts from a full and formal apology and it moves right through culture and health and psychological rehabilitation and an indigenous people's program and going right through to debt cancellation and monetary compensation. So it is not only about money, it is also about correcting historical wrongs, um, inaccuracies. Um, it is about recognition of the contribution. It is about development. 
And I think from the start, our CARICOM reparation, our heads of government have always maintained that this is a development conversation. It is not about individual payment payouts. It is about ensuring that there are resources to address the underdevelopment um, that the region has experienced because of enslavement, indigenous genocide, indentureship, and the colonial experience. It is the breadth of it. But in raising a legal case, we have to focus, we have to ensure that it is compelling and that there is no wiggle room around it. Um, in terms of who are the defendants, well, you know, I wouldn't claim to be an international lawyer, um, but certainly um, the, 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 it is the governments of the region are launching the reparations claim um, on behalf of the people of the region. And, um, and the mandate as they had articulated it in 2013 was for native genocide and enslavement. Okay, thank um, you. Up there and allow some other persons to come. Yes, yes, I have um, a, a list here, which I, I'm going, please listen so that you will know um, the order in which you're going to be asked to speak. So I have um, Sibani Roy, I have uh, Mr. Singh, I have Rosan Kanai, Tom, um, Niambi, Jay, and Peter. Th these are the ones lined up. So I start with, of course, um, Sibani or Sibani Roy. You have a question? No? Okay. I'll move on to, um, I, I think I had called on Mr. Singh before though. Um, did Mr. Singh have a follow-up question? No? Okay. Sorry, um, no, um, I have. Oh, I you have, have a follow-up question? question? I have put my question. Oh, okay. Uh, so the they'll computer. be saved. They'll be saved because I can't look at them now. Perhaps the moderator can help me by looking at the chat now. I'm simply oh, following no, the, hand, the raised hands. So, um, actually, Professor Shepard, yes. uh, would you like me to pose this question to you? Um, yes, please. Okay, so what Mr. Anirudh Singh asked, and this is for the, a response from Mr. Kirun Naidu of South Africa. He asked, if a class case in international law is to be raised for reparations for South Africans and others, one needs to identify the respondents or defendants. Who would grant certificate for a class action lawsuit, I imagine, from such a diverse group? Okay. So who, would, who would grant certificate for a class action lawsuit from such a diverse group? Okay, so um, let me uh, pose that question to Mr. Um, Naidu. Is he still with us? Is yes, greetings still? again, Sharon. Okay, all right, yes, go ahead. Um, yes, uh, thank you, Advocate Singh, for that question. Uh, I think that, um, you know, some legal minds need to unpack that in detail. Uh, but I think a very valuable precedent in this regard is the 2013 case that was brought before the British courts uh, by the descendants of the people who were involved in the Mau Mau revolt in Kenya. And that was a successful uh, class action suit in which the British government paid almost 20 million pounds in reparations to something like 3 million people. I think that those parallels are, are valuable. And I see also in the comment that um, somebody had made the point that the International uh, Criminal Court uh, in The Hague has the powers to deal with economic crimes. And the, this might well feature in that particular domain. Thank you, Chair. Maybe I can leave it at that point. Yes, thank you very much. Um, just to say, though, Mr. Naidu, that the question surrounding the case of the Mau Mau was that there were living people who could claim violation, and that was a, a, a big plus in that case. In the case of the descent, the, the um, people, well, enslaved Africans, there is this opposition, um, certainly mounted by representatives of Britain. Um, we have heard high commissioners say this in Jamaica, that they don't consider reparation for dead people. And I think it's up to us 
to say that's unacceptable. But let me move on to um, Roseanne Kanai for a question. Is Roseanne there? If, if not, I'll move on to Tom. Uh, yes. yeah. um, oh, good evening. Um, my question relating in three parts. Um, one is it says that we're all uh, looking to seek um, repar reparation. I think we shouldn't be trying to rewrite history or correct history um, for events to ask today's government to correct things that yesterday's government has done. Um, so in view like Nelson Mandela rule was uh, reconciliation, forgiveness, and move on. Some speakers alluded that some medical condition like diabetes is directly related to um, the Indian indentured laborers. I disagree because diabetes is a genetic and metabolic condition. The speaker did not give his um, reference or his, his source of that information, um, evidence to support that. Because if give you a, a, a brief thing on diabetes, India has about 10 to 11% of its population is diabetic. Fiji is 18%, USA and, uh, is 10%, Guyana is 12%, and Kiribati is 20%. St. Kitts and Belize are 15 to 16%. So you could see that it's, I can't see any relationship with indentured labors. And, and secondly is that when the Indians, I know about Guyana, when the Indians went to Guyana, there was a certain amount of money given to the, the government of the time for return fares to those Indians to get to India. When the Indians choose to stay in Guyana, the government at the time, who happened to be Indian descent, decided to use the money to build things that benefit all of Guyana, hospitals, schools, health centers, and cultural centers. So I, I disagree with, uh, uh, with the 11 speakers or 10 who are advocating reparation. And I think that we should have like something like a moral maze discussion with people on either side of the, the argument. Okay, um, thank you very much. I think we're having that though, because we have heard people say they're not in favor of reparation. Um, you, have also, you have also outlined your reasons for opposing certain aspects of it. And we have heard people say that they are on the side of reparations. So I think um, the, 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 we, we will have that full, we are, we are having that full discussion. And I think we don't have to repeat the pros and cons because I think they are very well articulated. I just want to say to you though, that I believe that reparation is considered a form of reconciliation. It's a route to reconciliation. So they are not incompatible. Also, we talk about present governments can be held responsible for past wrongs. Nevertheless, present governments and people in developed countries are continuing to benefit from the resources extracted from India, the Caribbean and other parts of the former British Empire. So I think that that argument can be put to bed. The issue of health, I think you have made the case though, by doing that panoramic sweep of the persistence of diabetes, I think you have made the argument because, and I would love those statistics if you could put them in the chat. It would be very good for us to have those statistics because I think what people on both sides are saying, in other words, those who are arguing for the health issue in terms of enslaved Africans and their descendants, and the Indians and their descendants um, through deceptive, what we are calling in CARICOM, deceptive indentureship. Um, we're talking about the diet, the, the diet on the ships, the diet on the plantation, the heavy sugar, the heavy salt, and that um, from what some medical um, practitioners have said, there's intergenerational transmission of the intolerance to salt and so on, it feeds diabetes and hypertension. So I think you are helping us to make the argument by showing us the uh, panoramic sweep. But thank you very much um, for your intervention. And I go now to, I think, Niambi. Oh, uh, Niambi. Good afternoon. Thank you all. Um, my question is for the speakers who asked to be included in the CARICOM reparations 10-point plan. Why do you currently feel that the needs of the Indo-Caribbean communities are not included? 
as the CARICOM 10 point plan is a developmental model of reparations that does not um, speak to individual communities, but rather the development of the nations generally. Thank you, Nambi. Before I go to Peter, and then I see Jay and Akshay and um, Kumar, um, does anybody want to answer that? Any of the speakers who um, criticize the 10 point plan and say they're not included and, and yet they are setting out development projects, economic reparation and so on. Would anybody like to say anything about that? If you could I would just, like, just I jump would in. Like to say just, something. Yes, Moritz, jump yeah. in. I, I have seen the, the uh, 10 points plan, that is very good. But why only the indigenous people and the, the descendants of the slaves are mentioned? That that's um, creates the most understanding. So I think it should be inclusively, explicitly mentioned in the in the whole plan that, that also the, the descendants of indentured labor, the total population of yes. the Caribbean countries should be included. Yes, uh, Maurice, may I ask you to go to the website and look at the concept paper, which is an introduction to the 10 point plan. If you do so, you will see that deceptive indentureship for about five years now has been added to the concept paper in justifying the reparation demand. Um, and uh, what we have been trying to do is to popularize that idea, but also to gather more information, more justification so that we can expand the concept paper. But for some, as you know, Morris, um, I am an author of Indian Immigration. Um, I've know. written um, about two or more books on that, Maharani's Misery, Narratives of a Passage from India to the Caribbean and Transient to Settlers, the Experience of Indians in Jamaica. And I am convinced um, from my research that this was an exploitative, deceptive system of bonded labor so that you would expect me as part of the reparation movement to say that there is a case for inclusion. Yes. Um, so so, so a, a CARICOM has actually um, included in the concept paper, but, we, but what we're doing here is to talk about it because there's still this perception that there's exclusion. And of course, I, I, what I like about this discussion is that there is a willingness to, to, to form a coalition. And I think that action point must be taken up. Um, it, it will be one positive, uh, another of the positives of, of what we're doing this afternoon. So thank you, Moritz. Let me go okay. to- um, uh, Let me, um, if I can respond. Yes. Um, right. um, Yes. You, have so, to, you have to uh, uh, apologize to those who are ahead of you. <laughs> yes. Say, no, because... um, organizers privilege. Okay, yes, so um, let me respond to first um, Mr. Tom about the diabetes issue. Oh, okay. Um, I have looked at the statistics. I have taken a broad sweep and I have a research assistant helping me in yes. case there was some oversight. And we looked at the uh, global data on diabetes. Um, he is correct because we're looking at PAHO, Pan American Health Organization, World Health Organization, and so on. By the way, I'm an executive member of the Trinidad and Tobago Diabetes, Diabetes Association. But sir, when you disaggregate the figures in these respective countries, Indians have a disproportionate uh, tendency to have diabetes. Yes. So, and remember, we, we, we are a minority in a lot of countries, but so you have, to, you have to disaggregate the figures. Secondly, since um, Ms. Hel Hillary Brown is uh, here on the panel, um, there has been much talk raised by uh, Hassan Khan, rightly so, um, that he has, and, and uh, uh, Professor Shepard has mentioned about 10 point, 10 point plan or 11 point plan, but how is that visibly, how is that inclusion visibly manifested? It is not, it is not. So this is a clear symbol, a clear picture. Every one of those in the CARICOM reparation commission are all blacks. There is not a single Indian, there is not a single Chinese, there is not a single uh, uh, first people in there. I know your argument about the government select and so on, but something has to be done. Mm. This is like apartheid. This is apartheid. It's manifest so. It's glaring. And uh, uh, even if we are 
even if we have to be there as ex officio members, we have to show that inclusion. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Mahabir, it's interesting because when I went to Trinidad to help to launch the Trinidad Reparation Commission, the Minister of Education, who was Indian, presided over the, 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 the um, function and was a part of the Reparation Commission of Trinidad and Tobago. And the Prime Minister at the time was also a member of the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Reparation. So it's not quite accurate to say that there's exclusion here. You, you, but but I, what I do agree with you with is that we have to popularize it more and ensure that the documents are representative of what's happening across the region. And it is true, it's the governments who appoint the national committees on, on reparation. Um, in Jamaica, it's a, I think it's, a, it's, it's balanced by gender and all other <laughs> criteria. But yes, um, we have to make sure that the visibility is, is, is there so that we're not accused. But I, I, I want to say as somebody who has been in this for such a long time, that um, it's not completely true to say there's, ex, there's total exclusion. Let me now go to Jay and then Peter and then um, Ash, Ashai and then Pritika. And I see you Nishan. So, yeah, I was calling on um on Jay. Yeah. Yes. I'm here. Go ahead, Jay. Okay. Now, just a comment. I love this dialogue. It's it's uh, really inclusive because we are all faces, all kinds around the world, and with my background in in fighting apartheid and freeing South Africa, and the family involvement, I feel a little privilege because you talk about crimes of uh, crimes against humanity that was after the apartheid regime was declared by the UN as a crime against humanity and we the indians the africans the coloreds and the whites in the party fought to bring that about now just a comment every discussion that we are having with everybody on this panel it's uh, bringing together a togetherness today. Now, going forward, this is what I propose, that this be taken to the United Nations. And good thing Dr. Shepard is sitting right here. She could carry it forward to go and bring this as a discussion in the UN to bring about the discussion on indenture because indenture is not part of the reparations that's talked about, about indigenous affairs and so on. We are a distinct community that were brought in from India during colonial times by the British, the Dutch, the Portuguese, and different parts of India. And some of the employers were either sugarcane farmers, tea pl plantation farmers, or even the municipal governments. So there were government involvement, church involvement, and private enterprise. So we should take this before the UN, uh, uh, what, what would you call that? Your committee, the um, one that we, yes, on, high, yes, on yes, human rights and racial discrimination. Yes, the committee on the elimination of racial discrimination. Exactly, yes. that should be a discussion mm -hmm. and that should be on the agenda. And yes. it should have inclusive components. That means everybody represented. Secondly, the issue of reparations. Reparations yes. is not just giving you a bundle of money. It's respect, your inclusiveness, and your dignity is needed. And it goes right back to the British Raj or the British uh, imperial powers. And down the pipe, we are working about the TRC in Canada right now, where the indigenous people are still fighting to get their reparations being paid. So I know the workings of all these things. So having said that, they should be a committee struck through the UN around the world, wherever we are, wherever we were thrown from the yokes of the British uh, colonial powers, to get a committee together to discuss this and go forward 
to get how we should get the reparations done. And the reparations is, at the end of the day, it might be a dollar figure, or it might be the respect, might be the inclusiveness, the education, and other health and welfare issues. So I, I leave it in the hands of Dr. Uh, yes, it's, it's actually- I not leave it in your hands, sister. <laughs> That's because uh, hearing CARICOM version, hearing the UN story, uh, I've been fighting this all my life yes, and my Jane. family's life. So I know the struggle. Yes, the struggle Jane. goes on and in the African language, our luta continua. Yes. The battle continues. So Thank let's you, put something together and yes. present it to the panel so that we can put our two cents worth and go forward. Okay, In Jay, thank voice. you. Yes, but I have to explain something to everyone on this chat. It, since you mentioned CERD, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, CERD can be a route to the International Court of Justice, but the General right. Assembly of the UN can also be a route to the International Court of Justice. If you're going to use the CERD, this is how it works. The International Convention of the Elimination of Racial Discrimination has over 20 articles. Article 11 allows for what you call interstate complaints. So the only way it can come to CERD, not by an individual member of the committee raising it, it is by the, the, uh, the, the one government, two governments, or CARICOM as a block, or India, or any other country that feels that Britain or France or Netherlands um, has uh, harmed them to send in to the committee what is called an interstate complaint. One state complaining against the other for violation which domestic remedies have not um, sorted out. In, any, in fact, I think um, not everybody has to show. I don't think Article 11 allows only if domestic remedies have been sorted out. But for example, if the if Britain, let's say Britain has put obstacles in your way and you can't get access to domestic remedies, an interstate complaint has to be brought. But the two parties must be members of, they have to be UN. signatories to the International Convention. Mention. So the interstate complaint is what will trigger a discussion by CERD. So that has to take place. And the chair of the chair of the CARICOM Reparation Commission has already has informal discussions with a small group from CERD to be educated about how this will work. So we are ahead of you and uh, um, those discussions, but, they, but the, uh, it has to be an interstate complaint. There are people who feel that it is better to go to the General Assembly and get the votes there because um, those who are wronged and they feel that they'll get sympathy with the votes in the General Assembly. So I just wanted to throw that out. There is a process and governments have to initiate that process. So let me now go to um, Peter. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, um, and then Ashai, and then we'll take it from there. But can uh, I ask the moderator to tell me when to stop? Because <laughs> we could go on. Yes, yes we'll do, we'll do. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, my, my um, question is more, if I can just briefly um, touch a, a bit of a background. Um, I am uh, very actively involved in cultural diversity. In fact, on the 25th of June, uh, I'm leading a cultural diversity uh, in Guyana, bringing uh, Canada, US, uh, um, uh, um, other parts of the world uh, to talk about how diverse we are and how we're trying to reach a common identity. In, in Britain, I'm actively involved with the Windrush generation and with recognizing black achieve, achievers uh, and putting up uh, statue, um, plaques uh, to, to honor them uh, because through the British uh, process, it takes an awful lot, lot of time. Um, my um, feedback, knowing that I'm coming to this uh, function, and I do endorse everything that I'm hearing uh, and the way 
the discussion is going on. So congratulations to the organizers. It's, it's very nice uh, to be part of some really interesting observations and, and uh, uh, depths of, of knowledge. Uh, people have said to me, well, um, isn't this device in uh, putting forward uh, indentiture uh, as, a, a, as a, a, an area for reparation? Now, my response is, yes, I can understand that. My grandfather uh, served his indentured ship and, and then uh, went back to India and, and returned to Gaya. And I wondered whether um, consideration is being given to the people like him who, who might, uh, in uh, carrying forward uh, this, this uh, um, proposal, find that there is uh, there what well, people, or met the majority of people, signed up. I've got in my book, uh, Recycling the Son of British Raj, I've got evidence of, of a paper in which they signed up, that they agreed to uh, go to, to Guyana in our case. And uh, in my grandfather's case, go back to India and then uh, back to Guyana. So are those issues being uh, promoted uh, and being analyzed? by the, the group who are carrying forward this very noble uh, proposal, which I fully endorse. Okay, Thank Peter. Um, so I don't think we can use, my own view is that we can't use a few cases of benefits to say the entire system was beneficial. Um, even under enslavement, there were people who got benefits for supporting the colonizers, and got pensions and freedom and so on. I think we have to look at the bigger picture and what we're stri striving for is unity, not, not division. We are seeking to have an inclusive movement which strengthens um, our case. Um, so that's what I would say to that. Um, Ashai? Thank you very much, Ryan. I know this is, I'm gonna be a bit regional even though this is a global audience. But with regards to your own uh, work at the UWI um, Center for Reparations, is consideration being given to the indentured laborers and their plight and, and whatever discussion needs to take place there? And if so, uh, what? Because we haven't really heard very much, or at least I certainly have heard, heard many public pronouncements about it. And I've noted that you, you carefully said that you are not the chair, but I will point out that the chair is from a country which didn't have much of indentureship, and you're far more with the, with the with the plight and the, and the issues. And so just interested to know what role that center has with indentureship and its CK. Yes, thank you, Ashaya. Well, I have to tell you that we, we have a very big role to play in this, and that's why we're here today. And that the chair himself has been one of the leading um, proponents for the inclusion of deceptive indentureship. Every speech he gives includes the term African and chattel enslavement, indigenous genocide, and deceptive indentureship. You can go back and listen oh, to his presentation. I know, but and, I'm just, yeah. So and, I'm just uh, no, the and the center, the center mm -hmm. in its um, public lectures and its publications and so on. If you look at the, the, the um, well, I will send some over to your office, the publications that we have, the flyers and so on that we have in the office, which include um, indentureship. And um, I've also used my radio show Talking History to interview very many, many, many people um, on this issue, um, including the Custis of, of um, St. Mary right now, yeah. who, as you know, is, is an Indian. So we so have been- yeah. Got to hear that, Brie. What I'm seeing is that you said in going forward, you're gonna do that. I'm asking- about No, 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 I didn't say going forward. I said, we have been doing this. I've heard mention of the term, not more than a paragraph. That's the point I'm making. But if you look at the concept paper, you will see that it's there. And in fact, at our retreat, Dr. Brown will tell you, at our recent retreat in Barbados, this was one of the big topics on the agenda. Um, I certainly gave a presentation to that that was carried in the press. So, and you have people from the diaspora there? Um, the, it Caribbean was a retreat. No, no, this was the out. This here that we're having is an outcome of the commitment by the Caricom Reparation Commission to ensure that we're not ignoring people who have been saying what you have been saying. 
And part of why this is going around is that people, a lot of people are not listening to what we're saying. But if, if it is that it's not going around, then it's our responsibility to talk more about it. So this is what we are doing today. And, this, and, I, and I think this is what um, will be the model um, going forward. But the Center for Reparation Research has been very, very active in this regard. But of course, we can't reach everyone and not everybody is listening at the same time. So we have to continue the work is what I would say to that. But thank you. All right, how are we doing uh, moderator? Because I, I need you five minutes or so to wrap up. Um, actually, actually, we've allocated extra time for today's program. So you, you can go ahead, uh, possibly for the next 20 minutes or so. Yes, and then give me about five or six minutes to wrap up because I think we there are so many issues that have come um, before us today that we need a kind of wrap up. So let me see sure. who is on. Actually, I before before you continue, Professor Toraboli wanted to make a statement about 10 minutes ago. Is it okay to facilitate him? Um, so yes, go ahead, because I didn't see that hand. I'm so sorry, but that, I must have been in the chat. So thank you, moderator. Um, Carl, Carl, go ahead. And it's such a pleasure to be talking to you face to face, sort of face to face here. I read your work. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shepard. Um, I've been listening to all those voices here in this historic meeting because really I appreciate what is being said here. Um, it is something we started in Mauritius some decades ago as a nerve center of what we call the British called the coolie trade, mm -hmm. just like the British called the slave, slavery, the slave trade. So that is people were in an objectal status, traded as objects or semi-objects. And uh, in the past, these two forms of ex exploitation of labor servitude have been opposed. And we did a lot of work to avoid what we call competition between victims of yes. history. Mm. And today what is happening, Dr. Shepard, is we are really talking, addressing the issue on an international plane, yes. Mauritius to Fiji, to the Caribbean. That's right. I would go back to a very fundamental text of, you know, you know, that was elaborated in Mauritius in 2009. I talk about this uh, earlier. It is a truth, truth and Justice Commission, you know, report, which has more than 2,700 pages plus two digital volumes, which covered a period of 370 years of history from three different empires, the Dutch, the French, and the British, with the slavery. Because as many participants here said, there were slaves who were Indians also. All the Indians were not indentured and all the Africans were not slaves. There were Indians who were slaves and indentured and Africans who were indentured and slaves. I think what is important here is to go beyond the ethnic and color bar. Go to a systemic type of thought and philosophy because the very first slave in Mauritius was Indian. The very first, she was a woman. The very first person to maroon in Mauritius was an Indian woman. So we have to go beyond our last or longing quarrels, silences, suspicion, and build something inclusive. This is a historic chance we are having here. Yes, I agree with you. Because reparatory justice for me is nothing if it doesn't bring reconciliation between all those pages of servitude that empires have imposed on us. And as dignified 
inheritors hears to these pages, we have to transcend this pain and build a better humanity. And I believe that if we succeed in doing this, transforming our pain, our trauma into peace building in the hearts and, and minds of, of men and women and children, this will be an example for the world. Why? Because plantation societies which have experimented variegated types of humanities are the matrix, the matrix of transcultural societies. And this is what I, I believe is fundamental in what we are doing besides financial reparation. Of course, some groups must pay or we must cancel debts. You were right in mentioning Haiti. We, we, we can find ways and means of getting some financial reparation, but this is not the main issue. It is how to bring dignity, peace, respect in our societies and build together, continue this dialogue between ourselves. Thank you. And, and grow to something better. Thank you, Carl. Um, thank you. Let me go on now to, I think it's Pritika. Um, and then I have um, S.H. Um, Singh and uh, Nishan Naidu and uh, I see Ashok. So that's the order, please. And be very quick with your questions. Uh, we really want to give as many people as possible a chance to have their questions. Go ahead, um, Pritika. Hi, it was um, kia ora and um, namaskaram. Um, I'm from New Zealand actually, but originally from Fiji and I'm a Gimrit descendant. Um, I really just wanted to um, highlight the disproportionate metabolic disease um, that really is an unmet need, particularly in the Fijian community, but I think it's directly related to the indenture. And the reason why I think we are such an important example is because we didn't have the same extensive of admixture that the other um, indenture colonies did. Uh, but I think this is going to be one example of where in a very applied bioscience where we can measure the genetic changes that have gone on to that are directly linked with our higher rates of metabolic disease. And I'm not just saying, um, you know, compared to the Indian population, we are, you know, double the rates of diabetes. I'm talking about um, being, for example, 2% of New Zealand's population we form more than 23% of the heart attacks that occur under 40 years of age mm -hmm. in, in New Zealand, for example. And New Zealand Shut the is... fuck up, bitch ass. <laughs> yeah, well, um, the technical people have to do something about that. We always have that. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's a disproportionately high rate yes. of disease that I think is directly linked to what has gone on in... Mm -hmm. um, among our ancestors due to um, the genetic pressures that were actually experienced during yes. the agenda, whether it was a founder effect or a bottleneck um, that is now linked to high rates of disease. But I think if we can study this, um, the fundamental science will be able to actually benefit these diseases across so many different populations. Sorry, that's my daughter. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. And we would like to keep in touch with you because I uh, think there's a group of doctors here in the Caribbean and elsewhere um, who want to further that research so that you know the, the evidence will be believable, the science yeah. um, behind that. So thank you very much, Pritika. Yes, Let we me... are We are doing genetic studies to yes. try and, um, you know, If you could that, put also, your I email just... address in the chat, um, I'll ask the moderator to, to send that to me so that I can pass on thank you. your name. Thank you so much. And now we go to, um, I think, um, who did I, Nishan? Nishana, Nishan Aidu? Hi, hello. Yes, your question, please. Yes, I think there was someone before me, but I am happy to go. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. 
Um, um, I want to say as well, thank you to the organizers. It is a historic discussion and I hope it, it's the first of many. I am a South African, um, has asked me to start my video. Okay, I will start my video. So I got a note saying start my video. We can see you now. Yes, it's very, it's 11 o'clock in South Africa. <laughs> thank you for being here. And we've also just had a second bout of historic floods to this week. So, oh dear. Uh, but I just want to say I am a descendant of enslaved people brought from India, and and I used and and I'm so niggers, glad. Niggers, 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 niggers. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Someone's. That, that's okay. We we won't be detained by that. <laughs> okay. Someone's crashed us. Yes, um, um, and uh, and I and I want to say that uh, it is enslaved because that was was because you know part of the colonial um, white supremacist mission is to name and rename and misname people, and we do not have to we do not have to um, accept that naming. We name ourselves as we wish. Someone just called me a nigger, a mandala to that. And because I'm a fourth generation freedom fighter in South Africa. And, um, and, and, and we should not allow those definitions of enslaved and indentured to separate us. I think there is a global, um, because like we said, divide and conquer is a great white supremacist colonial strategy. And I see your comments, Kojo, in the comment section. And please, let's not get into that, um, you know, fighting amongst ourselves because then we lose. Um, but my, my question is that given that what we have currently is a white supremacist uh, colonizing, neo-colonizing global system, all our institutions, structures, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the UN included, no offense, Dr. Shepard, but we do know that it was set up to maintain a world order. And, and that in it, as you can see, there is no place for us to mount a case. There is no law to support our cases because it was designed that way. So my question really is, not to, to uh, discourage us, but to really ask the question, can we really expect justice from an injustice, unjust system? Can we really expect justice from a legal system where there are actually no laws to uh, support what we're asking for and deliberately so? We have the slogan in South Africa, which is still relevant today, is that we cannot expect justice from an unjust system. We could not go to our legal system and ask for justice because it was an unjust system. So I just wanted to ask that question. Um, you know, can we get reparations or justice in a white supremacist neo-colonial system, structure, institutions? I also sit on, a, 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 you know, a global board and we are of, of alternative systems. And one of our members is Crianza Mutua from Mexico and Colombia. And one of the things I've learned from them, these are, these are indigenous people. And one of the things that they've taught me, they've taught me so many things, is that they say, who is going to bring us justice? Who are we waiting for justice for? And because they, they say, well, from the same people who per perpetrated the crimes against us. So that's just my questions. And I hope this is the start of a bigger, longer discussion. Thank you so much again to all the organizers. Okay, and thank you. People. I'll see who wants to answer your question. Um, let me go to Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh, your hand is up. And then after you, um, Ashok, after that. And then I will ask the moderator um, if the 20 minutes are up. Go ahead, Mr. Singh. There are a lot of things. Do you mean Shadan oh, and um, Sarina? Um, um, well, the sing with the hand up. <laughs> There's only one okay, sing with is, the hand up. Me. <laughs> it is a tremendous session today, and I'm very happy to be a part of this. My wife is a fast, but I took time to be here. I have two things. Uh, the diabetic uh, 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 issue, 
you know, as Dr. Mahabir Kumar said, one third of Indian people is suffering from diabetes. That we have to know. That is clear. The second is, as uh, Nisa Naidu asks questions, these questions are very, they are very important because we have to address these cases of slavery, of endangered labor ship, not like uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, reparation. That is real, real crime, a crime against the humanity. Mm -hmm. That is our approach. So we have to get together and we are not going to wait from CARICOM government or someone else. We have to bound, come together. Please listen my, my, my comment on your chat side. I have held a plea, you know, for justice. Bring these, 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 these criminals to to United Nations or, or something. You, you know, you know better. But our approach is better to address this question like a juridical question. It is a crime. It is a Gaya crime. talking about reparations for indentureship. It is a crime. It Mr. Is a Sahadeo, crime. Mr. Sa thank you. Please mute Mr. Sahadeo. Okay, I'm finishing. It is a crime against the humanity. Yes, thank yes. You. Uh, thank you. And I think that's what Dr. Brown um, was trying to say. But I, I, I think it would be remiss of me as a historian if I didn't say that um, even though some people are saying we should not create a, a hierarchy of oppression and that's not what we're trying to do. It, would be, it wouldn't be right for me to sit here and not say that um, chattel enslavement was a different kind of oppression than bonded contract labor. And we're not saying people didn't suffer, but the facts are there and we should not run away from the facts. It doesn't take away from our appeal for unity and strength going forward. But chattel enslavement was a crime against humanity. That is established and uh, we know that and we have the evidence. What we want to do is strengthen the evidence by looking at all other types of uh, colonial and post-colonial wrongs. So Ashok, you have the floor. Thank you, Professor Shepard. Has it been decided that CARICOM CRC is the body to take up Indian indentureship reparation cause. Uh, is, is it part of your mandate to have this global um, reparations act uh, going on? If so, why are we finding it? You're muted. You're muted. Oh, I'm still muted. I'm sorry. Yes. yes. Has it been decided that CARICOM CRC is the body to take up Indian indentureship reparations as part of CRC mandate? If um, so, why are we finding out? I have, I'm not finished. Oh, I'm sorry. Why are we finding out about it now and here? Are there Indian diaspora representatives in CRC who can speak for Indian indentureship? If so, who? And thirdly, how about Africa, Fiji, Malaysia, and Francophone territories? They're outside CARICOM geographical area. Yeah. Go ahead. Thank you. Now, um, one of the vice chairs is here who is in charge of membership and the network, um, Dorbrin Omar. So I'm going to ask him to answer that in a while. But just to say that the our network is being spread wide. We have people from Martinique, Guadeloupe, also the Dutch colonized Caribbean, Samartan, and so on. So um, Saba, St. Eustatius. So everyone who approaches us um, to ask for inclusion, and they are, they are included in all sorts of ways. So. We are building a network, is what I would say. But I'll let Dorbreen mm -hmm. answer. Awesome. And then I think we have to close after that so I can make some wrap-up statements. Um, Dorbreen? Thanks so much, Professor Shepard. Um, 
I think it's important that we recognize that the CRC and the work um, coming out of, of, of that organization is less than a decade old. <clears throat> and that we are in a process, I think, of self-examination and also recognizing that in order for us to build what we are considering an important global network, a global approach, that a number of issues have to be reconsidered. The mandate for the CRC came from the heads of government, and it does not include the question of indentureship. That is the mandate the CRC has at this point in time. We have recognized, and especially through the work of, of our chairperson, who sees the whole impact of white supremacy and colonialism in this region, as she generally puts it, as a, a, a play in three acts. And he recognizes the first act essentially as the genocide of indigenous peoples in the region, the second act of the play as the enslavement of African people, and the third act of the same play as this whole issue of indentureship that we are discussing here. Uh, Professor Shepard has uh, said a bit earlier that the, the call for this conversation has come from the internal work that is going on in the CRC at this point in time. Our chairperson, I would say over the last four or five years has been very, very clear about even in his own writing, his own speeches, his own thinking about the extension of the mandate to include what he defines as deceptive indentiture. This discussion is important for us to present um, the conclusions of this to our heads of government that set up the CRC that established the mandate for the CRC. It is not a mandate that we can take on to ourselves. Um, we are directed, we report to a subcommittee of the heads of government, um, five heads who sit on this subcommittee for reparations. And therefore this very, very important discussion, the results of this discussion will certainly be channeled back to that prime ministerial subcommittee on reparations for further considerations. But I think it's important, you know, at this point in time, although we cannot yet say it officially, but I'm sure you heard the words of um, Dr. Bone, you've heard the words of, of, of Professor Shepard, the question asked by Sister Niambi Hall, Dr. Niambi Hall. I, I think it is clear um, about the direction the CRC is headed in. Um, and as I am here, uh, Professor Shepard, if I may just ask, I, I should ask uh, Mr. What is Ramsaran, Ashuk Ramsaran, uh, a question. Sure, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I think that you have certainly recognized the need for, for in-depth negotiations about reparations for indentiture. You have also, I think, recognized the work of existing reparation groups. I think you mentioned in COBRA, um, we have very, very close associations with NAC, which is the National African Reparations Commission mm -hmm. in the United States, and of course the work of the CRC. Do you see a common approach or are you talking sir, about an independent Indian approach to this subject? Uh, collaboration is always the best route to go, okay. as long as there's a good vehicle. And if you look at CARICOM and uh, Mauritius and Fiji and Malaysia, these are outside your geographical territory. How does yes. that jive with your mandate? Secondly, uh, we don't like to reinvent the wheel because wheels have always been um, rolled over us. So <laughs> we like to use what exists because success is a, a good, uh, form of um, getting things done quickly. So I would like to know where does CARICOM say to it this, and um, how does it approach something outside its own territory, even if it means collaboration with 
African groups and others? Well, I think the answer about that is, is clearly uh, collaboration. Um, I, I'm in no position to, to speak definitively, but I would see it extremely difficult for CARICOM to be dealing with issues outside of its jurisdiction. I think clearly that we will recognize the sort of global trust of white supremacy and that the battle against it, and I think one of our speakers hinted to this, that the battle against it also has to be global. And therefore we are talking collaboration and we're talking serious collaboration. At this point in time, I would think that our agenda for this year and certainly our agenda at least for another 18 months is going to be the whole question of collaboration with African, African nations to come on board to deal with this, whether it's a legal appeal or it's a diplomatic appeal, or, or we are talking a moral appeal to those colonizers, those enslavers, that, that appeal has to be made um, global as the crime essentially and the continuation of the crime of white supremacy is global. Um, and so this is where we are headed. Um, our, our efforts uh, right now reaching out to various African heads of government and this is happening through also to CARICOM heads of government. It might be just interesting to report to this gathering that last year uh, we had the very first summit of heads of government of CARICOM with the African Union last year on September 7th. And that September 7th has already now, I think, been declared as an Africa CARICOM day and preparations for that summit, the next summit are all the same place. So admittedly, a lot of this will be probably around trade uh, as one of the key planks of, of, of that collaboration. Can, but can our, I, can, can I our leader has definitely gone out and been making international call, calls mm. for reparations, basically, and the call for Africa to come on board these calls. Okay, okay. thank you, Dorbreen. One, um, one, uh, one brief comment. One second, let's bring a little order to this. Thank you, Dobreen. Okay. Um, Ashok, very quickly, uh, we'll listen to you on Dr. Brown, and then I have to wrap. Okay, I have to run too. Um, it's been two years since the pandemic, and this group here, today I recognize 132 plus um, Facebook, plus um, YouTube and whatever, and it's been vibrant. So when uh, you talk about 18 months more to make a decision. I don't know if this group can wait that long without feeling antsy and anxious. So I suggest CARICOM CRC put its head together and react faster to get us on board. Thank okay. you. All right. Um, and of course, um, that global consultation has been going on for a long time. Um, we have networks in the UK, USA, in Europe, um, many parts of the Caribbean, uh, you know, so, so that network building is continuing. Dr. Brown? Thank you, Prof. Shepard. Um, and I also want to say that, you know, I agree that this is an important conversation that we need to continue to have. Um, because we are building a movement and we are developing a strategy and it really needs to have um, all of the viewpoints and all of the issues taken into consideration. But I just wanted to add something to what um, Mr. Omar just said in terms, in relation to collaboration and also mention that, um, and he, he referenced the Prime Ministerial Subcommittee on Reparations, which is chaired by Prime Minister Mia Motley. And, um, and I could also mention that Prime Minister Motley last year, around September, October, also wrote to Prime Minister Modi in, um, in India, um, inviting India's collaboration, um, a dialogue with, with CARICOM heads of government, with the CARICOM Reparations Commission to see where we might have, um, you know, our respective perspectives are aligned 
and how we might be able to work together in advancing this reparations movement. So I thought it was important to mention that in addition to writing to the African Union, um, Prime Minister Motley also wrote yeah. to, to the Prime Minister of India. Yes. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Brown. And uh, as somebody mentioned COVID, it's just the past three years and what has been happening in our societies that caused the invitation that had gone out to MP Sashi Tharoor from being activated because we wanted him in Jamaica to continue that um, conversation he started at the Oxford Union um, when there was that debate over reparations. So it's not just today we have been um, reaching out, but um, I also want to say, though, um, as we as you know, I wanted to make a few comments um, before I get to those. Um, the when I when I reached out to the Indian community in Jamaica to to because I've been working with the Indian community in Jamaica for a very long time. And when this reparation issue came up, I tried to canvas um, several people in the committee and in, in the community. And I, I didn't really get um, a kind of positive response. And that's why I'm not so surprised um, by Professor Mansing's intervention, because it's like, that's the kind of pulse of the Indian community in Jamaica that I was getting. But nevertheless, please remember, and you know, as our sister spoke about white supremacy and Dorbrin also, white supremacy is not new. It has been around for centuries, exactly. our Indian ancestors fought against white supremacy through their resistance activities to it, to the to the you know the unfulfilled promises of indentureship or enslaved Africans fought against it. They have been fighting white supremacy for a long time. So we 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 don't have to um, hesitate about the strength of white supremacy, but we can't give in to it. We have to continue the fight against it. And I tell you, if our Indian and, and African ancestors had said it's too big uh, an issue, it's, you know, they have too much of a hold on us for us to fight, maybe indentureship would not have ended and, uh, and enslavement would still be walking around with chains and so on and so on. So we have to take courage from, what, from the courage of our ancestors. They never accepted uncomplainingly. And I have the advantage of having studied the two systems of exploitation in our region. They never said, we are going to put up with this. There's always been resistance and we have a responsibility to carry that on in their name and to unite around the issue of reparation. But there's nothing stopping communities, different communities, NGOs, in their um, associations and so on from mounting their own um, activism and advocacy around the issue. We need all hands on deck. So, Madam Moderator, could you give me another few minutes to just wrap up with some thoughts? I didn't yes, take my full, I didn't take my full time at the beginning because I was so anxious to hear what everyone um, had to say. But let me say a few more things here. So, when we having listened to everyone, it seems to me as if um activists, historians of Asian indentureship, other historians, all advocates. We have mined oral and archival sources. And I think this is what I'm getting from what people are saying. The recruitment system in India, especially for women was fraudulent. And we all know that there, over time, there was a shift from the 50 to 100 quota to lesser just to encourage women. And that from my book, Maharani's Misery, you'll see what happened, the rape and so on on the ships. We have heard that despite written regulations, the pre-departure depot conditions were poor, the shipboard conditions, despite protective treatment guidelines issued to the captain and crew was horrible. The journey via sailing ships was treacherous. And I'm thinking of the Alan Shaw and the Salset right now. Um, and on the south set in 1858 to Trinidad and Tobago, 124 of the 324 people died en route after a journey of 108 days, an average of more than one death per day. Ships were spaces of sex exploitation and the threat of rape of women. Women who migrated were stereotyped as loose women. 
Indeed, the subaltern woman was stereotyped as having low morals, and many examples exist of sexual abuse by captains and crew. And the plantation conditions um, were unreflective of contractual agreements regarding wages, health, and accommodation. And women were not encouraged to work, or, or when they did work, they received lower wages than men. They were tricked into opting to migrate. So talking about people opted to migrate, you, you opt when your, your, your certain conditions are placed in front of you. When you realize that the conditions are fraudulent and the promise is not kept, you're going to resist. This is, this is not to say all aspects were voluntary. Yes, they were not free to move, but had to get passes on the plantation, just like the enslaved. And they had to go on strike and mount resistance strategies to get attention to their conditions. Furthermore, evidence shows that the post indentured years for those who did not repatriate was characterized by racial discrimination. Repatriation was denied after a while. After gradually imposing a charge to the repatriates for part of the cost, the entire cost was eventually placed on those who wanted to go back. Certainly that's the case for Jamaica. Some had to return to the region because they could not find family where they had left them. And even um, Gandhi, discourage repatriates, telling them they were half disindianized and deculturized Indians, not even knowing the language of their country so that they were better off staying in the Caribbean and to be integrated. Other reasons posed for reparation for Indians were that missionaries, employers took away names and language and forced acculturation on them. In Jamaica, many Johnsons and Browns and Williams are Indians. Countries like Jamaica refused to accept certain cultural practices like cremation and marriage and burial and divorce customs. People were stereotyped and called offensive names like coolie. The land given in lower repatriation was non-Arab land. In Jamaica, only those who bought plantation land or those who received land grants in flat Arab areas were able to make a living post indentureship. Education was slow for the community so that in some countries, one could hardly find Indians at tertiary education institutions well into the 60s. Poverty was a state for many rural Indians and rich Indian business people and professionals are another wave and not necessarily the products of indentureship. A lot of time, these are the people who are successful and people see these and use these as a divisive um, weapon against the community. Now, there are counter arguments and I heard some in this chat and in the conversation. Now, so opponents to inclusion argue that Asian indentured workers signed the contract before emigration, that the system was voluntarily, that there were no raids to capture Indians or separate them from family. On the contrary, family emigration was encouraged. The opponents argue that there were regulations surrounding accommodation at the depots in Madrid or uh, Madras or Calcutta. Regulations govern the size of ships, unlike Africans and, and, and the Middle Passage. There was space allocation of passengers. The ratio of crew to passengers was laid down. Law uh, regulations said there should be no molestation of women and the crew should not come near the women. The diet was attended to according to whether they were Hindus or Muslims. And, the, and apart from the Salset and um, a few other ships, the mortality rate was generally lower than on um, the Middle Passage ships. Indians were not chattel. No laws defined them as non-persons or as property. Laws prohibited flogging and other forms of cruel and inhuman treatment. Of course, practice differed from what was written down. And so on the plantations, they received wages. They had a protector of Indians that had hospital care. In Jamaica, most of the hospitals were built after Indians arrived. They were not built to cater for African people. They could not be sold or separated from family. Repatriation was an integral part of the contract, unlike um, slavery. And their personal information was captured on documents that made family connections in India traceable, you can look at the emigration passes. Um, many people argue that they receive benefits like land or cash in lieu of repatriation that gave them a better economic post-indentureship life in the Caribbean. 
but we have heard again from our presenters that what was promised was not necessarily what was given. We have heard the percentages of those who, who got land. Nevertheless, we cannot ignore these kinds of um, documentation which look at the laws that were passed to control Africans, the laws that made them non-person. We have to look at the Middle Passage journey and we have to look at the historiography because if we don't do that, we're going to continue to deny that um, slavery, chattel slavery was not equivalent to indentureship, but that's not the purpose. We have to talk the truth about history, but at the same time, whether or not everyone is convinced about the reasons for inclusion versus exclusion, what is undeniable is that collectively there was marginalization of various peoples in the Caribbean during the colonial period, which contributed to generational social and economic inequality that still permeates the region today. The reparation movement must therefore embrace all stories and seek forms of restorative and reparative justice that would help to elevate the positionality in the Caribbean of all our people and get amends for the structures of abuse that they endured. Transformative reparations is what the movement demands. Including other groups does not mean don't play the rightness of reparation for the greatest crimes against humanity, the trading in Africans, chattel enslavement, and post-colonial harm. So thank you for the opportunity. And that's where I'll end my participation today. Thank you very, very much, Professor Shepard for being here with us as our feature speaker. I just want to make a correction to, for the interest of Dr. Devanand Babwan. Professor Shepard is not here as a regular panelist. She's here as our feature speaker in her capacity, her numerous capacities on the reparations committee and in the reparations conversation. Um, Professor Shepard, thank you very much for managing the Q&A the way that you did. We are really enlightened by everything that you've shared. And having said that, because of the conversation, we would like you to entertain a second program. So we would liaise with you, if that's okay with you, in order to plan same. And to our participants, we would advise you accordingly. So I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to say a special thank you to all of our presenters. Thank you very much for your time, your expertise, and for being here to share your knowledge with us. To all the members of the CARICOM Reparations Committee, thank you so much for being here with us, and we would love to have you again. So once more, we will share uh, via Professor Shepard with you. To our participants, thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, please continue to send us your comments, send us your questions, and liaise with us via email if that's possible, so that we'll know how you would like us to plan for our second conversation. Indeed, this is very valuable, and we must take it forward. So at this time, I'd like to say thank you very much to everyone for being here. I'm Shalama Mohammed, and I will now hand you over to our chair, Ms. Kerry Ann Abdul. And thank you, uh, Shalima, for being such a delightful moderator. Thank you all so very much for taking the time to participate. Thank you especially to the presenters who were so vibrant and so passionate and so informative today. As I've said before, this public meeting is being hosted by the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Center and the Amina Gafur Institute for the Study of Indentorship and its Legacies, led by Professor David Abdeen. This program is also being supported by the Sports and Culture Fund of the Office of the Prime Minister of the, of the Government of Trinidad and Tobago. The topic for next Sunday will be Pioneers of Indian Arrival Day Observances in the Caribbean. So please join us for that. Please like, share and follow our Facebook pages. I am Karyan Abdul Ramjatan saying thank you and good night. May God bless you all. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. And um, hope we'll have a part two again. Uh, Dr. Shepard, let's hope take another dimension when there are new developments and so on, and there's more to report. 
would Sydney like your advice on this? You you have to unmute if you want to speak. Okay, anybody want to say something off the record, Ravin? You can stop recording and live streaming. So, right. Yes, so anybody? Kumar, um, yes. Kumar Davidin here. Yes. Um, can I say that? Um, can I really thank Vareen Shepherd for a magnificent um, set of interventions? Um, it confirms it confirms what I've known for thirty years since I first met her that she, there's something awesome about her. <laughs> And yeah. I think today, I think today is a historic moment um, in terms of the discussion about the possible inclusion of inventorship into the whole reparations movement. And um, and so, on behalf of the Amina Gafur Institute, which co-sponsored this, I would like to thank Vereen Shepherd profoundly, and I look forward to a continued dialogue, Vereen, whenever you are free. The Amina Gafur mm -hmm. Institute. Unfortunately, it's the only such body in existence at the moment uh, dedicated to the study of indentorship and its legacies. Um, so we, we, we're always here to, um, to, 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 to support any initiative that you have, uh, Vareen. Thanks. Thank you, David. And remember that over the past two years, we have been talking about um, collaborating, a collaboration between the um, I mean, a Gafor Institute and the Center for Reparation Research, and we'll continue that dialogue. Thank you. Yes, that's uh, great. That's great for me. Yes, Jalaluddin has his Jal has his uh, hand up. Jal, be quick because we have been sitting here for three hours, and we want to stretch our legs. <laughs>